We've seen how to paint something a little bit simpler, but how would I paint something more realistic? So let's take a look at this pumpkin, and I'll try to explain it in a way that makes it easy to paint something more realistic. So where do you start when you're painting something more realistic with watercolor? In general, I find that the better the sketch I'm working off is, the better my painting ends up being. So I usually start with a really simple sketch with a really light pencil. I erase it, so I just have the general shapes kind of outlined, and then I switch to a little bit of a darker pencil and I make sure that I outline the spots where highlights are, where shadows are. It makes it easier to use it as a map when I move on to painting. One other tip is to roll over with a kneadable eraser when you're done so you pick up any loose graphite on the page. Now that I have a sketch down, one thing that I like to do is map out a palette that I'm going to use on the rest of the piece, and I can kind of reference it as I continue painting and just make sure everything's sort of what I expect. Now here's where the first technique I think really comes into play, and it is wet on wet. It's not an uncommon technique, but I think it's a really interesting way to use it. So first I'm going to wet this whole sort of first slice of the pumpkin, and then I'm going to drop in these colors. And if you look at the reference photo, obviously the light's coming from the upper right, and so the shadows are going to be on the bottom left. And so as I'm dropping in these colors, I want the more purplish hues on the bottom, and I'm going to fade it into lighter yellowish hues on the top. Now, this is just a base layer. These are going to dry, and they're going to be quite a bit lighter and less saturated than they look when the paint is wet. But that's all right, because it's, again, it's just a base layer. I'm going to go back in with additional layers in the future, and darken them up, saturate them up. But what it'll, it'll be useful for is when I'm painting the highlights, those really light colors are going to be a sort of useful base state for the highlights, and I can continue to build on the shadows without uh, too much worry. What I think is super powerful about this technique is that I can take the reference photo and I can kind of break it down into sections. And so as the pumpkin fades further over to the left and more into the shadow, it's going to use more purple and red tones in that wet on wet. Now, as I go to the right, it's going to have more oranges in that wet on wet technique. So uh, it's a way to sort of tone and, and you know keep it really simple at the base layer level. Watercolor is all about flexibility and simplicity. So doing that first layer in a really loose way is a great way to build up your tone slowly. Now, one really important technique to note here is that as I move to the right, there's this highlight on the right side, and it's the pumpkin's kind of shiny, so it's, it's a pretty bright, defined highlight. And so what I've done here is that, while it's still a wet on wet, I'm leaving certain areas of that pumpkin where the highlight's gonna be dry. And so when I drop in paint, it's avoiding those dry areas and keeping them white. So using this wet on wet technique, you can get these really smooth gradients, but you can also leave really blank white highlights on the page. Some of you might be asking at this point, why did you paint every other stripe of the pumpkin? I don't understand. Now, that's for a very specific reason, because as these ridges on the pumpkin fade from right to left, they go from shadow to highlight. And I don't want those shadowed areas to mix in with the highlight. I want there to be a distinct color difference between the shadow and the highlight. So there's a line between the sort of purplish color and this golden yellow color on the right. With the first layer down, this is a good opportunity to take a step back and let the painting dry. You're going to notice that when it dries, it's quite a bit less saturated than you might expect it to be. And it's certainly not as saturated as you want it to be. That said, the first layer is important for a couple of reasons. First of all, it gives you an understanding of what the actual color and shape of the painting is going to look like. And second of all, the highlights of an object in the real world tend to get less saturated as they are more bright and exposed to more light. In contrast, the shadows tend to maintain that saturation. So what you will end up doing in subsequent layers is building up the saturation in the shadows while still leaving some of that unsaturated, desaturated look in the highlighted areas. You'll notice that at this point, as I move forward, most of the layers are done on dry paper. And that's done so that I can maintain some of the shape and contours of the pumpkin without it all sort of bleeding together. The way I like to think about it is that you don't add all the details in a single step. It truly is layer by layer. And so some of the details just take building and they take layers before the illusion of detail is really complete. 
For instance, you'll notice that each slice of the pumpkin tends to go from shadow on the left to highlight on the right, and each slice is divided by a sort of crack in the pumpkin. But between those, there are still variations, and there are shadows within each slice. And that is something that I build up over time. You can think of each layer as laying the groundwork for the next layer that you're going to paint. Because the paper is dry, I can paint this shadow down the center of this slice here, but still maintain those highlighted, less saturated areas. And now that there's contrast in it, it looks more realistic. Realism within art is about creating the illusion of detail. And I think that's especially true for watercolor. Given that it's somewhat of a less precise medium, you need to work doubly hard to make sure that the details are convincing, but you don't really have the control to paint all of those details. If you were to really zoom in on that pumpkin, you'd notice all kinds of tiny little textures, and there frankly just wouldn't be a way, unless you were working on a really big sheet of paper, to add all those details with watercolor. So instead, I focus on sort of bigger picture textures, because I know that when you view the piece from more than six inches away, a lot of that is going to be lost to your eye, and a lot of the details that I'm adding are going to get blended together and create a more illusion of detail. While watercolor might not be the best for adding tiny, tiny little details, like you might see in a graphite hyperrealism type of piece of art, it is really good at creating natural looking transitions of color and saturation. You have full control over the saturation of each layer that you're adding with watercolor. And so by, by controlling that saturation, by adding more water or adding less water, you can control how much change is happening layer by layer. And that is typically how you start to add some of that texture in to your painting. One of the trickiest things about watercolor is starting to understand how much that color is going to change between when it's wet and when it's dry. And I think that's a part that a lot of people struggle with because it, when they put down the paint, it looks really bright and colorful and they just keep adding and adding. And then when it dries, it gets dull or brown or muddy. And so trying to understand that difference is a great first step in getting better at painting dimension with watercolor. Now, full circle, here's where thinking about your palette can really make a big impact because I'm at this point realizing that it really is lacking some of the saturation that I want. So what I can do is take one of the colors from my palette, this sort of orangish yellow color, and glaze over all of those base layers of shading and texturing to make a more saturated look on the front of the pumpkin. I'm generally a proponent of using fewer colors in that palette uh, because watercolor is a subtractive mixing medium, meaning that as your colors overlap and they start to absorb more light from those wavelengths, that's why paintings can tend to get muddy, is if you mix all the colors together, you get a black or brown color. So the fewer colors that you're using in your palette, the more you're able to add glazes, like just an orange or a yellow over other oranges and yellow to sort of add to that saturation. Now I am using a more purple color for the shadows of the pumpkin, and that's a complementary color of yellow, meaning that they are going to mix to create a duller, muddier color. And so to make those areas more saturated, that's where I'm gonna think of my sort of color theory and add red uh, tones to that purple instead of yellow to make it more saturated. Now red is a more analogous color both to the purple tones in the shadows and to the orange tones in the, the mid-tones. So adding red is a nice transition between the shadows and the mid-tones and will create uh, more vibrant and saturated colors in that pumpkin. As I paint the stem of the pumpkin, it's going to use pretty much the same technique as the rest of the pumpkin. So I start with this wet on wet layer where I can get these base tones down and the general flow of the color is apparent to me and I'll let that dry before moving on to the next layer. I'm using more of a bluish green for the mid-tone area and then I'm adding in purple, the same purple that I use on the rest of the pumpkin, to the edges and the areas that are shadowed. This is another good example of letting areas dry between when you add the first and second layer, especially when you're working on small areas like the stem of this pumpkin. It's very easy to go fast and forget that it's still wet and then all of a sudden you've just sort of eliminated all of the texture and variation of color within that piece. But there is something really important that's happening up here and it's a key part of making this painting look realistic. And it's the cast shadows, not only on the stem, 
but also behind the stem. These are the two darkest areas on the whole painting. And I'm not painting the background, but you can obviously see that the darkness behind the pumpkin is darker than the actual back side of the pumpkin. So I wanna make sure in order to get this sort of dimensionality correct, that these cast shadows are the darkest spots on the pumpkin. And just like everything else on the painting, you build that darkness up over time with more and more layers. Hopefully you found this useful, and if you did, leave a comment below, and as always, subscribe for more watercolor. <laughs>